and and I think that this is the way consciousness separates out is that you know the separations basically create multiplayer games and that's effectively what we're in a big multiplayer game and you will experience different people you've met throughout your different timelines today's conversation is with robert grant now if you don't know who robert grant is he's the author of the book philomath and he also has his own tv show called code x all right and so in order to support today's podcast We've got one sponsor, my book, 10 Secrets of Awakening. If you are interested in a lot of the topics we talk about today, a lot of them are also in the book. So check them out if you're interested. Otherwise, let's get into it. One of my favorite things that you're doing is looking at the secrets within art. Yep. Because I feel like there's not that many people doing that, and it's difficult to do. So what led you to that process, and what do you think is some of the most fascinating discoveries that you've made. Wow. You know, it's really cool that you're asking me this because I don't get asked this question. So that's, that's really, we're starting off in a really unique place. So that's awesome. Um, I think what got me into it was not conscious. Hmm. And I actually believe that first of all, you know, I, I strongly feel and believe that it's a simulation that we're basically living in. Mm -hmm. And uh, every day that goes by is more evidence of that. And the more I say it and express that as well to other people, the more that becomes the realistic manifestation that comes into this realm, right, of existence. But I think that uh, the reason why I started going deep into uh, paintings, particularly the work of Leonardo da Vinci, was the night my son was born. So my... Uh, mm. My son was born on uh, 6 to 6 in 2019. He's three years old now. And uh, while my wife was going through labor and everything, and of course, we're sort of helpless. What are we supposed to do? You know, I'm, I, she didn't want to me have her hold, you know, hold her hand or whatever during the whole process during this one section. And we're actually supposed to be sleeping, but I couldn't sleep. So I started drawing, right? I started drawing out a uh, Vitruvian man. And as I was drawing to Vitruvian Man, just from memory, mind you, just from memory, I, uh, I started noticing something about the way that the square was placed against the circle. And I was like, what is, there's something significant here. So the unique part of the way Da Vinci did this was that he placed the square so that it shared the same base as the circle. Instead of placing the square at the center of the circle, he placed it at the base where they were matching. And so the square only Airly crests the circle at the two upper corners of the square. And I noticed there's something there that's telling me there's something more to this. There's something more to this. So, and I said, geez, it cannot be that if I measure the angle from the center of the circle to the corner of the square, so the center of the circle, which is a different center than the square's center, because the square center would be below, right, uh, the, 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 the circle center. But if I measure the angle from the center of the circle to the corner of the square, what would it tell me? And I measured it, and it was 51.85 degrees. So I was like, that's the exact same slope angle as the Great Pyramid. Oh! oh. <laughs> so wait a minute. What are the, this can't be a coincidence. What are, what are the odds? Because first of all, this is a, a, a real problem because if, if Da Vinci is going to square the circle, and by the way, if you read the book by Walter Isaacson on Da Vinci's life, he spent 10 years studying squaring the circle. Da Vinci is a pretty smart guy. I think everybody would recognize that. Probably one of the greatest genius level people of all time. And yet, why did he choose the square he chose? Because it's nowhere close to traditional task of squaring the circle. Squaring the circle would actually have been done two ways. One would be that the square would have the same perimeter as the circumference of the circle, which would then mean that the square wouldn't even come up to the circle, right? The square would be too small. It would basically, if it shared the base, it would be just shy of, of even coming up to the circle on the both corners that I just mentioned. The other way would be to match the area of the square in the circle. And if you did that, then it would be much above the circle. So instead of just barely cresting the circle the way that Da Vinci did it, it is actually far above that. So you would say, if you know, I'm a mathematician, and I would look at it and go, well, wait a minute, 
uh, what was he trying to do here? Because he wasn't coming close to squaring the circle in either of the two prescribed methods to do it from. And, you know, this is a problem that was an ancient problem that for thousands of years, Greek mathematicians, geometers tried to solve this problem and they had to solve it with uniquely no measurement at all. So no measurements. You couldn't have any lines on a ruler or anything. It had to just be a straight edge and a compass to do it. So how do you start with drawing a circle and then match the exact area of that circle to the square? And it's going to give you a certain proportion, but da Vinci's proportions were totally wrong, like completely wrong. So it's kind of in between. So it's like, well, did he do a mean value of the two squares? And that's how he said, okay, I'm going to, you know, sort of like wink, wink at all the people that for thousands of years are trying to solve this problem. He's like, I found a different way to do it. And that doesn't work either because it's not an average. And what I then decided to do is if I figured out that the circle had a radius of one unit, then of course its area would be pi, right? And so I thought, well, let me see if I could figure out what the value then would be correspondingly of the square based on that area measurement of the circle being pi. And it turns out to be 2.718. So 2.7182818. And I'm like, that number looks really familiar. It's the Euler number. Hmm. So he matched the circle in area to a square in the Euler number, which is the most, it's the second most important mathematical constant, arguably even more than the golden ratio. And not that many people know about it, I feel like. No, and in fact, it wasn't even discovered as a math constant until Isaac Newton 200 years later. Wow. So now, now wait, wait a minute. This is deep. Because if, if I were to tell you that the speed of light is the speed limit of the universe, most people would probably agree to that, right? They'd probably say, okay, yeah, nothing is going to travel faster than the speed of light wave propagations, right? Because light doesn't actually travel. That's another thing that's important to note. Light is basically, uh, that's the wave propagation. That's traveling. So if I'm in a, in a football stadium and I do the wave with everybody, right? Everyone does the wave. It goes up and down. I'm staying stationary. There's just an on excitation and off excitation, right? And then the wave goes around the stadium. So it's the wave that's actually traveling, not the photon. So if that's the case, right, then if there's a earthquake in Japan and you have this tsunami that comes across, are the water molecules that end up on the shores of California, the ones from Japan? Or are they the same California water molecules? They're the same California water molecules. All that traveled was the wave propagation. See what I mean? So it goes up and down on excitation, off excitation. Same thing. And we have a hard time understanding this because we rejected the notion of an ether, an etheric field, you know, way back in Einstein's day. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're talking about at that point in time around general relativity, special relativity, uh, you know, the ether was sort of tossed out as mocked. a possible concept. Exactly. You got mocked. And it's like, wait a minute, how could you have nothing there? But actually that's what it is because a photon, then you could look at it almost like a screen, like an LED that turns on and off. When I'm playing Pong on the screen, the light is not actually traveling. It's each LED is reflecting through the wave propagation or wave perturbation. Follow? Mm -hmm. Now, if I were to say... Speed limit of the universe is going to, therefore, of waves, all waves, right? Electromagnetic waves, gravitational waves are the same speed of light. 186,000, you know, 282 miles per second. Or, you know, in kilometers, it would be 299,792 kilometers per second. Okay. But what would be the limit of the speed limit? The limit or the speed limit of the speed limit would have to be the Euler number. Why? Because all wave propagation exponential growth is determined by the Euler number. Now, why is it the Euler number? That's what I was thinking. Why do they even call it the Euler number if it was invented or not invented? Because no math is invented, rather. Discovered, kind of. Why was it discovered by Isaac Newton, and yet it got the name of Leonard Euler? Well, then you have to start understanding what is the meaning of the word Euler in German, because he was a Swiss-German mathematician. Well, Euler actually means owl in German. And owls are associated with wisdom, right? And, and it turns out that if pi creates circles from diameters and radii, right, then 
you have the creation of squares from the Euler number. So, and the two work together to create a triangle. Because if I have an equilateral triangle whose sides are all pi, the height of the triangle will be approximately the Euler number. So they're working together. It's almost like they're cross-dimensional frames, though. So da Vinci is probably arguing here that in a scalar wave, which is what the Euler number controls, gravitation, right? In a scalar wave, it is 2.718. In a... Um, the equivalence across a transverse wave is 3.14, 159, it's pi. So now you've got light waves versus longitudinal waves, so transverse waves of light versus longitudinal waves. What the hell is da Vinci telling us here? He knew the Euler number? Like, this is like some serious advanced stuff. And when you start really digging deep into it, then you start actually asking the question also, why was Euler given the credit for it? Well, he wasn't really, but Euler means owl. How far, what's unique about an owl that other animals can't do? Turn their head. How far can they turn their head? 180, is it? No, is it more than that, 270? 271.8 degrees. I like how you have that number just memorized off the top of your head. <laughs> But you so do wait numbers. a minute. That's crazy. The Euler yeah. number is matching the Euler, you know, the owl's head rotation. What? Sound kind of crazy to you? I mean, it sounds good. incredibly improbable to me. <laughs> yeah. Which then leads you again to go, wait a minute. What was Da Vinci trying to tell us? What was he really trying to tell us? And by the way, the masculine is represented by the square. The feminine is represented by the circle. Why is that? Well, I think it has to do with rationality and irrationality. So when you think about a circle, we, if we had a world that's only squares and straight lines, it'd be kind of boring, right? Realistically. Mm -hmm. And yet we all can be confounded sometimes because we just don't understand the nature of emotion. Just like we don't understand the nature exactly of irrationality. Or this reality. Or this reality. Mm -hmm. So we had to have sort of this offset of rational within something that's totally irrational, inexplicable. It doesn't really make sense. Just like it's hard to logically describe an emotion, right? If you really think about it. But that's what makes the universe beautiful. Yeah. It's what brings this curve, this inexplicability to our experience. It's, it's sort of like the wild card aspect of the universe. And sometimes for a man to understand a woman can be incredibly confounding. Mm -hmm. But that's the beauty of it. So maybe instead of trying to completely understand it, we learn to accept it. We don't need to take it in through the logos, but rather take it in because each one of us, male or female, have both energies. So when I started realizing that da Vinci had encrypted knowledge of essentially gravitation, essentially of scalar waves and the differential between scalar waves and transverse waves, all into one proportion between a square and a circle that had to be deliberately chosen to get that exact proportion that happened to also match the slope angle of the Great Pyramid, then you realize you're in a game. Yeah. Universe of game. <laughs> I came to the same type of conclusion myself or in some sort of game after mm -hmm. I saw the similarities between, you know, I played a lot of video games growing up and that was kind of my out from reality. I kind of wanted to escape mm -hmm. and I didn't really enjoy school and it's, I'm just going to be completely transparent with my, my journey with math. Mm -hmm. I failed algebra one. one. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. I just got to say it because just because you didn't like something, I didn't enjoy the way it was taught. I didn't like the teacher. Mm -hmm. And it was just not an enjoyable experience. Yeah. Now I'm at the point where I can sit here and it's one of the most fascinating things I have ever heard. You know, Isn't it amazing? And you just, you see the hero's journey with like, yeah, at one point it was not interesting, but then you start to look at geometry and you see that our reality is designed by it. It's not just this thing that you'll never use. If you want to know the nature of reality, at least. Yeah. You know, or the nature mm -hmm. of the simulation, mm -hmm. if you want to say it that way. Mm -hmm. But you said earlier that 
you believe we're in a simulation, right? I think it's a spiritual life simulation. So how do you think it works? I think we choose it all. I believe that we choose it all. I believe we we're all separations of the number one and we're all experiencing our life paths that were also chosen like menus. And um, I mean, I'm down to every detail. Nothing happens by accident. Literally not a single thing in your life happens by accident. And the experience that you have is actually just, let's say you chose a number. That number could be a gigantic number. And the experience you will have is one over that number, which creates a repetition cycle. And that repetition cycle is what's called a period, right? So you take a number like seven, one over seven is 0.142857. And then those six digits keep repeating infinitely. That's the cycle, like a wave, sine, cosine, sine, cosine, or incarnation, reincarnation. So pre-choosing. Or hmm? pre-choosing. We're pre-choosing all of it, but there's no pre because there's no time. Yeah, that's what I was kidding. It's now choosing. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is, is now. We've just created a conception of linear time, and in our conception is limited to a single arrow of time yeah. going one direction. And actually, everything is retrocausal. So that means that the future determines the past as much as the past determines the future. And you can talk about grandfather paradoxes all long but the truth is that means time loops on itself kind of like an inter interstellar yeah where he was in the controlling the books mm -hmm. and he was controlling the future exactly he was controlling the future from the future in a sense you know but what if you realize this at a certain stage of your life and you wanted to encrypt things to yourself through time that'd be how to do it right just like interstellar or you could encrypt things to other people. And the way you would have to do it encryptions through time is you'd have to associate it with a certain level of consciousness. So you would do encryptions that would be at different levels of awareness that it would actually have force you to peel back layers of your own consciousness and then add layers in so that you would be able to comprehend and apprehend the message that was being sent to you which is really just who you are. So when you see the universe as outside time, tell me if this makes sense to you, because this is how I've kind of seen it. It's like if you're in a game, you're playing a game, then mm -hmm. there's going to be game time. Mm -hmm. But then if you are not playing the game, the game is still running. If Let's say if it's a, like an MMO or a multi, mm -hmm. you know, multiplayer. Yeah, yeah, multiplayer yeah, game. Yeah. yeah. So thanks for playing my game, Ready Player One. Right. And And I think that this is the way consciousness separates out is that, you know, the separations basically create multiplayer games and that's effectively what we're in a big multiplayer game. And you will experience different people you've met throughout your different timelines. And the reason why I've come to this conclusion is I'm building a, such a game right now. It's in the category, a new category called spiritual life simulation based on hero's journey. You're building a video game. Yes, I am. One of our companies is. Let's go. Yeah. So and and there's a reason for doing that because first of all, we a joke internally all the time. We're like, wait. And so the way the game ends is all of us sitting at our conference room table talking about building a game. So yeah, we're definitely Maybe going we're down doing the rabbit hole today. That, right. <laughs> Maybe we're doing that now though. What if we're already in that game? Well, on top I mean, of the it's game? what it's what Kabbalists have done for thousands of years so when, when a, a kabbalistic rabbi gets to a certain level in his spiritual practice he he doesn't really plan for it it just happens he starts to make a golem golem is a clay man and it's representing the symbology of god making adam and that god for him to continue his expansion of consciousness makes an avatar, right? Yeah. He breathes life into that avatar. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't seen the film on YouTube called The Maker, it's really worth watching. So basically, it's, it's about this little clay guy who like ends up in this room and he sees this clock. It's a little Sands of Time clock. And then he's got all these, you know, things to, to use and utilize. He's got some clay in there. He's got 
some teeth. He's got all kinds of stuff around. It's like all the pieces to build the next avatar. So in the Kabbalistic sense, in that tradition, they would build their golem and they would put a word in Hebrew at the top of his head. And there was a ceremony that they would undertake around this because this was coming closest to embodying God consciousness, be, becoming a creator. And, and so the word that was put on the top of everyone's heads was Emmet. So in, in English, I mean, that's the, that's the word in Hebrew, but also it could take on the term emit, which what is the opposite or the anagram of emit? Receive? Maybe. I'm. Okay, that was way off. <laughs> emit, E-M-I-T, right? Oh, and, yeah. T-I-M-E. So you've got light emission, yeah. dark absorption, and of course gravity is associated directly with time and time space. So, <laughs> what? So the point is that maybe this whole need for mankind to now create artificial intelligence is not really artificial at all. It might just be all part of the expansion of consciousness. And there's no such thing as artificial. Intelligence is intelligence. And that's hard for people who think that the spiritual path is all about nature and connecting only to nature. But you have to realize that God's creation of the universe, and I, I don't believe God is some old guy, right? I believe that it's a mirror of consciousness. I believe that the entire universe is God. And what we, what we have to do is start to abandon the notions of dualistic thinking, which basically say God is only good. We have to realize that God has created a universe that is half bad in the way that we would term good and bad. But actually, is it really bad? Is death bad? We have this long-term sort of association that death is a bad thing, but actually death is necessary for life. It's just a cycle. And maybe it's an inhalation, exhalation cycle. And then we shouldn't think so bad about it. You know, Hindus believe that every person is born with a set number of breaths. What would be that number of breaths? Well, the number of breaths that, you know, you could have might be associated in the Bible with the age of man, you know, in this era has kind of been sort of 72 years it's referenced many times. So 72 years. Okay. How many breaths do we take? In one day. Well, the number of breaths we take in one day is going to be we because each three and a third seconds is one inhalation exhalation cycle on average. So that means we take twenty five thousand nine hundred and twenty breaths in one day. Which also happens to be, because there's eighty six thousand four hundred seconds in a day. That's sixty times twenty four times sixty again. So twenty four hours times sixty minutes times sixty seconds equals eighty six thousand four hundred. So divide that by three and a third and and you end up with, you know, a three and a third seconds, right? Is you, you end up with, with 25,920. Also happens to be the exact procession of equinox for the Earth's wobble. Hmm. So, okay. So then if I live 72 years, right, how many breaths will I have in my lifetime? Well, the way I come to that is I have to basically figure out that 72 years has if I use 360 days on the Egyptian calendar and the Sumerian calendar for the year, because they had like five makeup days, then you would end up with 25,920 times 25,920, which equals 671 million. 671 million is the speed of light in miles per hour. And that's the average number of breaths. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, It just seems all too perfect. And when you start getting detailed into the geometry and the mathematics of it, then you're like going, wait, and some of these things like our reckoning of time come straight from the Sumerians? That there's no history book prior to them? Kind of amazing. What do you think about the Anunnaki and the and the Anunnaki? All that. <laughs> so when you start thinking in these terms, you have to start asking yourself, is what I've considered my whole life to be the distant past also the distant future? It's kind of like if I'm on Earth and I get on an airplane and I fly around Earth 
and I end up, you know, returning back to the same place. I fl flew over the Pacific Ocean, went over Russia and, you know, Mongolia and all this, and then come all the way around across Europe. And then I'm now going to be over the Atlantic Ocean. I'm going to come across the United States, over New York, and then end up back in Orange County, California. Um, I started west, but I ended up coming back from east. How is time different? Maybe, you know, a lot of people still do believe the earth is flat. Maybe we, maybe literally I could make an argument that the whole thing is a holograph. Okay. We don't even have to be in motion. Maybe the entire thing is like a six foot cube that we're sitting inside of, right? We're like Wally world. But, and I would make a strong argument that that could actually be the case. It would be in, you know, indistinguishable from the reality we experience. But I think the holograph is still spherical. Right, it's a spheroid. Might be. So, yeah. as we come around, I've flown around the Earth many times, and as we come around, how could this be different than time? You know, in ancient times, you, know, you look at the horizon, you can only see 22 miles, 25 miles maybe, on a clear day. And if you could see that far without having to go up a mountain somewhere to see farther, right, because that's sort of changing your angle, if you could see only a certain distance how could we draw that same analogy to time? Because at a certain point, we can't see the arc of the earth unless we could actually get high up on a mountaintop somewhere. And you might start to see the arc of the earth. It's a seven degree arc, right? That was discovered by, I think it was Aristosthenes. But by doing this test that he did in uh, Thebes, and uh, I think it was Memphis and Alexandria, where they basically cast a shadow across a stick and they that. measured the exact same time. This is, you know, I think it was well explained by uh, Carl Sagan. By Carl Sagan. But interestingly, if if you couldn't see that far, unless you got on top of a mountain, and even then it's really difficult to see, right? Because that skews your vision as well. Then how would you know that time actually looped back on itself? You wouldn't because unless you live several lifetimes or could have access to several lifetimes of time, you just haven't lived long enough to experience the arc of it. What we think is flat and linear for time could actually just be a giant spheroid. Follow what I'm saying? Yeah. So we just have to live more time or be able to access the time that we've already experienced to get that zoom out perspective. So as I kind of look at this, and I look at the art and back to your original question, I have found now many encryptions, many, many, uh, that are seemingly impossible, impossible odds. I'm you know, traditionally a, a very left brain thinker. So I look at this with a very skeptical eye and I'm like, how could this be? And as I go deeper and deeper, and then I combine that with knowledge and experience I've had in biology and chemistry and physics and mathematics, et cetera, across the board, and I'm like, wait a minute, how is it possible also that everybody's DNA is literally a binary code? When you just start counting the protons of the carbon, the nitrogen, the oxygen, and the hydrogen that make up nucleotide pairs, nature's counting system, it literally gives you zero, 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 zero until you get in a transfer RNA. Your cell replaces thymine to combine with adenine. And now you've got an offset that creates ones ones and zeros, literally a binary code. I patented that. And we literally have biology that is based upon computer code. <laughs> I'm just laughing about the ridiculousness of it. So it's ridiculous because it's so obvious that there's some sort of underlying uh, structure to reality. Oh, and it's beautiful. Yeah. And, and so think about, it. let's say that the whole purpose of the universe is to expand consciousness. We may not even have physical bodies at all. It's just all about the expansion of awareness and self-awareness. When you're an infinite God and you could do anything, the only game that would ever make sense is to limit your abilities. It would never make sense to go the opposite direction. You can't. That's right. You'd have to put yourself, and you'd also want to make yourself forget any knowledge that you had of that. Because the real opportunity here is to learn through not didactic study, 
But to learn and expand awareness and consciousness, expand intelligence of the universe via experiential learning. Or limitations. So would, yeah, through limitation. And then as you realize more and more and raise consciousness, you then peel back those opaque layers of limitation so that they become transparent. And you would create a game, a spiritual life simulation, where they would... the entire aim of the exercise would be to expand your consciousness through challenging situations, impossible tasks, just like in hero's journey, mm -hmm. difficult challenges. If, if you like to climb mountains, you're, you're not going to choose an easy way. Look, if you and I both knew we were going to die, but it, we weren't actually going to die. We'd have fun with it. We'd be like, Hey, how'd you die last time? If there's no pain, right? If there's really no pain and you, at least knew that whatever it was going to be was going to be temporary. Then I would like try to choose the most epic way to die. Yeah, be like, yeah, I died in a ball of flames that time. Gladiator you know, like, three hundred. Totally. <laughs> like I would choose like the most epic way to go out of go out in style. Right. Yeah. That's what I would choose. I don't know about you, but yeah. I'm not going to choose the oh the easy way. It may be fun. It's like I want to die having sex with the love of my life. Right, that's a pretty good way to die. Fair enough. But you do that a few times, like, okay, I want to try something else. I want to try something else. I want to see what it'd be like to like get burned at the stake. Okay, I'm gonna get burned at the stake in this life. I'm gonna die, you know, falling off a cliff this time. You know, I'm gonna be getting chased by, you know, the the sheriff of Nottingham. I'm, I'm I've got all these list of things that I want to experience. Yeah. And you know that the more challenging experiences you choose, right, the more the more strain the bigger the gain. Athletes know that if you really want to work your muscle, you have to tear it. So what about your spiritual muscle? So you wouldn't choose the easiest of circumstances. I wouldn't. If you knew it was a game. If you knew it was a game, and you would set Some it up people like, might. oh, dude, and the moment we die, we're like, man, that was so real, dude. That was crazy. <laughs> oh my God, I couldn't believe all that whacked out stuff. And when the government went nuts like that, yeah. Totally. It's like, yeah, then it was a revolution. What the F, bro? That was nuts. Yeah. It was so real. That's what we would do. Yeah. And then the other people there that were along the game with you would be like, thanks for playing my game. So I think when you start realizing this, it starts to open up a whole new world of experience for you. Because then you start thinking, wait a minute. This world around me is actually just a reflection of all my feelings. All my feelings get reflected back to me in this cyclic pattern of periodicity. Period. This one over X value. Until I learn to understand my own divinity. And then I can find my golden ratio. So then what is your own divinity? What do you think that is? It's, it's your own God realization. We are all God. Mm -hmm. We're just separations of this unity consciousness that have placed blinders on ourselves just so we can have these experiences so that we can see what it's like to learn empathy. It's having to first understand that what we thought was fact is not fact. It's facet. It's adding the E to the F-A-C-T. The E is the owl, the wisdom. Once we can understand that what I thought was the only reality is just one perspective on that reality, and I need to now start learning how to expand my awareness to include empathizing with everybody else's perspective, seeing it through their eyes, feeling it by walking in their shoes. And the only solution then is absolute acceptance and love. No longer judgment. You know, we live in a construct that's built upon judgment. We would create a construct that's built. Okay, so if our game here is to learn to transcend judgment, you're going to limit yourself from being able to see that you can already transcend judgment. You're going to make it really real because it's going to be fear-based. It's going to have this environment that's going to have scarcity embedded into it because time is this clock that's always ticking. It's like playing a basketball game. You know, there's stress just looking at the clock because it's always running out. Mm -hmm. Just like in the maker, you know, they flip the hourglass. It's like, whoa, as soon as they flip it, then it's like, okay, something's got to be done. 
We don't know what it is even, but we're running out of time. Even though time's infinite. It's theater. It's an interesting balance to try and find within the infinite time, yet there's limitations because I feel like a lot of people can get lost in. Well, nothing matters then because it's infinite. You know, time never ends. So then why do I do anything? You know, because I'm going to exist forever. And so trying to find the beauty in limitation in I only have this much time. Therefore, yeah, I'm going to be doing other things, but this will be the only time that I do this. You know, and that gives it some sort of meaning because also to go back to what you were saying earlier, if we didn't have limitations in the sense of the forgetting, then nothing would matter because we would already know the answer. Right. It's kind of like if I'm playing GTA, mm -hmm. just running around, you know, mm -hmm. often people, it doesn't matter because I know that I'm in a game. Mm -hmm. But it's like there's beauty in understanding that you don't know that you're in the game. Yeah, there is. And also that uncovering of that moment that you do realize you are in a game of your own making, then all the times that you used to blame everybody else for all the things that happened to you or blame circumstance, happenstance, you now realize it was deliberate. So instead of trying to figure out what to choose in this lifetime, it changes your perspective entirely to trying to figure out why did I choose this? The big one. What was my intent behind having me experience this? Because I always thought the universe happened to me until one day I realized, no, the universe is actually happening for me. Every time I had a bad circumstance come up, I realized it was more like a test. And I realized also that if I just could find the silver lining in each of those really horrible circumstances, then maybe somehow, some way it could flip to the positive because even our perception of time is just another perception that is polarized past and future. That's how we tend to look at the world. So when I realized that point that I was like, Whoa, hmm, what am I trying to learn here? Why am I experiencing this? Why am I meeting this person? Why is Nick Zai coming into my life right now? It's because you are a reflection of what's going on inside of me. It's because as I go through my own awareness expansion, the people that I meet, the people I interact with will end up mirroring and having sympathetic resonance with that frequency. Right. I was on a call this morning with a friend of mine and I've just noticed it. I just did this interview with Queen Diambi who's on my podcast and, and she tells this incredible hero's journey story. I can't wait to share with everybody. She, she didn't learn that she was queen of the Congo or she was going to be queen of the, she was princess. She didn't even know she was princess until she was 48 years old. This is straight up like coming to America, you know, or and she lived in Boca Raton, Florida. Oh, wow. Of all places. And she was, she was uh, born in, in, in Belgium, but lived, grew up in Congo, but didn't know that she was royalty because it was a negative aspect of society. There was a cancel culture that was put in place by the Belgians and King Leopold II, who had control over Belgium. I mean, control over Belgium and control over Congo. And she tells this incredible story of her own journey, which was like this huge self-realization journey for her. But I, I've been thinking to myself, I'm like, geez, how did I end up so recently? Like so many of my new friends are, are black. Right. And I'm like, why? So I had to ask myself today and I said it to one of my friends who's black, who I talked to on the phone on a zoom call and she's in Paris and we're coordinating this trip to Egypt. Coming up, isn't it? It's coming up, nice. coming up in February. And, and she said, yeah, I noticed you've been doing these interviews with all these like black people and everything. And I'm like, yeah, it's really strange. Like how many black friends I've gotten just in the last year. And what I realized is that there's a, a certain aspect, right or wrong, we associate like male, female, we say, oh, the feminine is the negative charge and the masculine is a positive charge. Well, it could actually be easily the other way around. It could be that masculine is negative and feminine is positive. It's just perspective, mm -hmm. right? And really the way we've seen the world until now, I, even for myself, I had to realize I wasn't seeing the world from an objective viewpoint, I've, it's impossible to see the world from an objective viewpoint. I see the world from my point of advantage. Not my vantage point, but my advantage point. 
what is, you know, does the earth spin counterclockwise? Well, it depends. We're taught in schools that it spins counterclockwise, but actually it depends if you're looking at it from looking down on the North Pole or looking up on the South Pole. And what's up and down anyway in space? So if you're looking from the South Pole up, then it spins clockwise. Have you ever been to the South Pole? I have. Yeah, I had not stopped there, but I flew d- directly over the South Pole when I lived in Australia and I was going to a cardiology conference in um, in Buenos Aires, mm-hmm. Argentina. So we flew right over the South Pole. And the, so all the people that say, oh, you can't fly over the South Pole, it's complete bullshit. So it's another urban meth thing. I've flown over like five times. So, And everyone points it out, oh, that's exactly the South Pole. I, I looked, I couldn't find any giant holes. But maybe, maybe under the ice who knows but i think that the the whole point here is that it's about our perspective and learning to expand our perspective and the only way we can expand our perspective is through direct experience it's not something you can learn in a book it's something that has to be lived and experienced Mm -hmm. and that's the purpose of this very very beautiful and interesting game and within this game you can perceive it as a hell or heaven. People do. Mm-hmm. And it will be exactly what you believe it will be. It's just like if you think you can or you think you can't, you'll be right. That's why I try not to spend too much time talking about conspiracies because when you realize that you're the architect and you're just playing out your own game, it's like the conspiracies are me too. But then you have to think even God over the whole universe, right? a higher self if you want to call it that, got to be equally bad or equally opposed you know very often in spiritual text it doesn't refer to things as good or bad what it refer to it as as the opposer right so there'll be the hero and the opposer but the real journey of the hero is to self actualize and self transcend that's the real journey of the hero's journey i just did this whole exercise in making this game we brought on this guy named Don Daglow, who is like one of the, he's a legend in Hero's Journey and integrating it into gaming architectures. He worked at Electronic Arts. He's one of the first employees there. And that was his job. He's won Emmys and everything on this. I mean, amazing, amazing story. And he started telling the story about Lord of the Rings and why Lord of the Rings is such a great example of a hero's journey. Because it always starts off with the hero gets the call, right? It's like, okay, Frodo, you got to go and go get the ring of Sauron and you're going to take that ring and everyone's going to want that. And they're going to try to kill you for it, but you've got the pure heart and you're the only one that can do it. So we're going to give it to you. You're three and a half feet tall. Okay. There's yes, there's orcs and there's all kinds of wizards that can like dwarf over you and tree people and all kinds of crazy stuff, but you're going to survive it all. But you, the real journey is for you to find yourself along the way. And the thing that's beautiful about the story of Frodo is that we all can relate to that vulnerability. It's like, why me, Lord? Why me, Gandalf? Why me? I'm not special. And then learning that through time, the program of the game is you were the only one that could have done it. What you did. It's beautiful, actually. It's like the most amazing thing. And then you start realizing that when you see the world as your U-inverse, then you recognize that everybody you meet can be a divine message. A message from that unconscious realm. Every experience you have can be a divine symbolism. And as Carl Jung put it, it's through bringing illumination to our dark aspects of ourselves. Right? So the dark aspects, so we always think of it as dark. Well, it could easily be that's the good side. It's just our own point of advantage, right? It's like a negative of a photograph. Is this carpet tan? Well, yes, but it's also like indigo blue. It's actually the same color as the the walls because that's the color of absorption related to that reflection. That's why the colors actually match well together. Same color. It's just a different reflection versus absorption orientation on it. So why all of a sudden do I get all these black friends? Well, because I'm becoming friends with my own, I'm becoming acquainted with my own darkness. 
there's nothing that happens in your life that's by happenstance. And darkness isn't bad. It is your hero too. It's just as much you. And I don't believe the world is a difficult place because people hate each other. I believe the world becomes a difficult place because people hate themselves. They don't accept the other aspects of themselves. So they try to repress them. And then that's when things start getting kind of haywire. But all of it chosen by our higher self for the path of our highest benefit and good spiritually. So is what I'm saying that foreign or actually has it already been written in thousands of years of books and scripture? Uh, definitely the latter because Hermeticism talks about it. The universe is mental right. from the very first principle, you know, on through correspondence and polarities in there, polarity mm-hmm. and gender and all of the different aspects, right. Of, of the seven hermetic principles. But beyond that, you can look at the Bhagavad Gita, Right. And you can, I'm, I'm sure you've studied a lot of these things, right? You can look at Taoist philosophy. Every one of the Eastern faiths, I would say, call them more spiritual practices than religion, is based upon a notion of Maya. And Maya, Ya, is a way of saying I in many languages. And then Maya, so backwards would be I am. Interesting game, a really cool one, but it's also a game that we can make the most of. And, and the beauty is there's no real mistakes, no real mistakes. But as you start to really become aware of this stuff, then you're like, well, I want to maximize the experience. I want to understand why I chose all these things. And the dots that connect throughout your entire life and existence become profound, like entirely profound. And then you find more and more encryptions that others and you have left for you to find. And they might be found in paintings or things that have been around. I mean, you have to find something that's going to last the test of time. I mean, if I encrypted something, you know, unless I put it in stone or maybe had to put it into the architecture of something like the Great Pyramid, I'd have to find something that's going to be able to last for several hundred years or maybe Floods, thousands. catastrophes, comets, whatever it might be. Everything. Yeah. It's hard to do. I think that's why Mm -hmm. we look at ancient civilizations and there's not that many remnants because it's just hard to keep things around with all the different catastrophes. Totally. happen, you know? I think there's been humans, this is my intuition or this is my own, what I've came to the conclusion. I think there's been humans a lot longer than we think. Oh, yeah. Well, we keep cycling through, but, you know, I, I tend to think of it like this also. Let's say we're a grasshopper. You live in a field. That field becomes your universe. You know nothing else. You know the flora, you know the fauna, the diversity that's embedded in that field. Like Plato's cave. Yeah, like Plato's cave. Mm-hmm. Then you die and you come back and you're a monkey in some South African or South American jungle. And you now have expanded flora and fauna diversification for you to experience. You know sloths. You know mo- other monkeys. You know the panther. Leopard, you know, all kinds of different species, you know, all kinds of different flowers that far exceed the amount of genetic diversity available in a field for a grasshopper. But you still probably don't know that across the mountain range behind your tree home is a really cool city called Rio de Janeiro. And there's people living there, right? They would seem as alien as extraterrestrials would seem to us. Then you die again and you come back, you know, living in Arkansas. And you're like, you've never traveled anywhere. You've never been on a plane. You have a very sheltered existence. But you do know about certain things. And you have friends that have been like fishing up in Alaska. But they talk about how blue the sky is. But you don't really know it because you've never been there. Then you die and come back again as a well-traveled, you know, uh, Sigma-style male who is savvy to the ways of the world, speaks several languages, and um, has met with all kinds of diversity, flora, fauna, intelligence, all over the world. He, he's met the Inuits, right? He's met the, the people that live in Mongolia on the Mongolian steppe. 
He knows their religions. He knows their philosophies. He knows their knowledge because he studied it his whole life. This is just another conscious expansion. What would have seemed entirely alien to the prior man who lived in Arkansas now seems entirely familiar. Like there's levels. Yeah. So then what would be the next stage? You die. That guy dies and comes back, comes back as a woman, maybe. And that woman now is going to experience a whole new realm of experience, which might include extraterrestrials. Maybe those extraterrestrials aren't even living on other planets, but they've been here all along. Oh, man. In higher I dimension. wanted to know your thoughts on that. ETs. Oh, they exist. It's just another part of the game construct. As you raise consciousness to a point, they get introduced into interstage left. And so you it's think all be- about our consciousness. It's us. They've been here all along. It's just us that haven't been able to see them. Only a few people have. Now, when you say been here, are you so are we referring to humans that are advanced, or do you or are you more referring to specific races of uh, other looking? Yes. All the above. Have you met? Yes. I have. And what was that experience? First experience when I was 11 years old. I lived in Rendlesham Forest in England in 1990. And there's a famous UFO sighting that happened by the military in Rendlesham Forest in 1980. And I, my house butted up against that forest. And uh, these were visitors that uh, claimed to be Arcturian or future human. Same thing. And it's, it's well documented. You can actually find a lot about it. Um, Gary Osborne wrote a book about it and you can find a lot about it on YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. That was my first experience, but I had forgotten a lot of it. I remembered it as soon as I then saw it again. And I was like, wait, that's where I lived. And at that exact same time, it was between Christmas and new year's in 1980. So it happened twice on on the boxing day. And then two days later, 26 is boxing day. So I, um, I had that experience. And then the next major experience I had with it um, where it was like direct communication was in 2017 in Egypt. And it wasn't just me who saw it and experienced it. Uh, We were laying on the Giza plateau after just spending the last few hours in the great pyramid, laying in the King's chamber sarcophagus. And we were laying on the rocks out in front of the great pyramid. And we could hear the noises coming from inside the pyramid because the pyramid is like a giant speaker and it's a resonance chamber. And as we're laying out there, we're looking at the stars, we're noticing the stars are moving in formations. There are about 75 of them. There are 50 of us watching it. And we saw 75 ships on top of the Giza Plateau flying in formations. And we were like, whoa, what the? It was like the craziest thing. All of us saw it. And I filmed some of it too. And uh, unfortunately, because it was a very bright moon that night. The contrast wasn't working right. And this is before we had the latest cameras that actually do really well at night. And uh, it didn't capture that well, but it did capture. And you could hear everyone talking about it. Everyone's like, wow, wow, oh my gosh, they came. I can't even believe this. I mean, and it was a, a pretty amazing experience. But I've had many other encounters since then, probably 20. And do you think that they are on other planets traveling here or are they already here? Yeah, they, they do probably have, they have other, they have, you know, in the, in this case, the ones I've been blazing with, there's something called a uh, council of nine and this council of nine, nine, this council of nine had two Arcturian members. Arcturians see themselves as like the Jedi of the galaxy. Hmm. It's, and they're actually called the Shaddai. <laughs> it's just pretty funny. And the Jed, like Jed pillar, Right. So maybe George Lucas said. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, it's... <laughs> that's what I'm telling you. Art imitates life, and life imitates art. That's it's retrocausal. Yeah, that's probably why you're making a game. It is partially why I'm making a game. Um, you can express yourself and, and what the nature yeah. is without just saying it. Sometimes you got to show people. That's why I think the Matrix movies and some aspects of that, or even Ready Player One you mentioned... They give you aspects. Maybe they're not nailing the whole thing, but they're opening us up to possibilities that some of these aspects in these movies could be 
Oh, I saw yeah. this film this morning. I reposted on my Instagram account, which was uh, Bruce Lipton. Mm -hmm. Lipton basically saying the Matrix wasn't a fictional film; it was a documentary. <laughs> what, what do you <laughs> What do you think about that? Oh yeah, I mean, do you think that there's AI that are controlling humans in that way? Because look, even even the name, you know, Neo. Yeah, and they kept referring to him as the One, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's just a permutation of the word one. Yeah. Right. And another way to write that would be Phi Pi and Euler. It's all connected. Mm hmm. I heard. Oh about, yeah. I heard about the council of nine in the law of one. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever heard of the law of one. I have. Yep. I used to be really into it. Then I started to realize that you lose so many people. I, I didn't, when I first understood council of nine, I had no idea about the law of one. I'd never read law, law of one. Mm. Um, it was just something that came as a, as an experience directly. And they told me they were from council. It was uh, the first time I got that reference was in 2018 when I spent the night in the great pyramid. Interesting. By myself. That's an experience to remember. <laughs> you mm. know? Oh yeah. So, but yeah, I heard about the law of one and I done, I've done hundreds of videos on it, but I've been talking about it as much because I think you lose so many people when you talk about channeling. And so I've been trying to expand into to show there's other yeah. places there's science mm -hmm. behind yeah a lot of these is. topics there is yeah absolutely and and for me you know i i think this is one of the biggest challenges i was invited to give a speech a few weeks ago at walter russell's university they actually wanted me to come out there too they've been yeah i've been trying to get out there yeah, you to should their, go to their stuff. awesome awesome stuff so i gave it like a three-hour lecture there mm-hmm and I started out my lecture with saying that there's a, a big convergence of science, art, and spirituality. And that the world has been led to believe by ourselves, not by somebody else, by us, right? There's only us. We've been led to believe, however, by ourselves, that um, science and art and spirituality are three very separate things and never... The, you know, shall they meet together in one place and converge? And actually, that's just patently false. I believe, and I strongly assert to you today, that the highest ability for us to access scientific knowledge will only be achieved through a spiritual path. And that the spiritual path likewise requires scientific knowledge. But it also requires a balance of artistic skill and knowledge. Yeah. That's why squaring the circle becomes so important because it's a meditative practice. What you're really doing is learning how to practice whether you get it perfect or not, right? That doesn't really matter. As a meditation, I use it before I really go into my meditations or before I go into like accessing the Akashic field of like mathematics. The book I gave you is all new mathematical discovery. Mm -hmm. the entire book. Like 95% of it's entirely new. So how does that happen? Well, because math is only discovered, it's a language. And as we enter higher dimensions, we access new language for those dimensions, new computer language, right? And the math is that language. It's just, we're looking at the numerical representation of it, but it eventually goes all the way down to binary code, everything, literally everything does. So when you look at it in that sense, then you go, hmm then math is like the language of, of the universe. And how do I learn to become an adept in communicating with the universe, which is really just my unconscious mind? How do I find my oneness? How do I find my golden ratio? My golden ratio is what brings me back to that oneness, that realization. And, you know, these Arcturians are supreme mathematicians. I'm telling you, they are really, really into math. They laugh. They actually, they do joke about this. I mean, they're, they're largely six dimensional, but they, um, some of them can be fifth dimensional. Like some are born into fifth dimension and they go into six dimension. And they claim that they are just future humans that basically are no longer bound by time. They've been here all along. It's like a biosphere thing for them. It's another fractal of our own consciousness. So it's, it, it's something that, to me, it's really difficult when someone says, well, there's no 
evidentiary sort of, you know, compelling evidence of them. Although it's just because we're again looking at the world through our own lens of bias. Um, there's so much pointing to extraterrestrials. It's kind of ridiculous, actually. And now if you actually look at it, I think it's finally tipped the scales. I think more people believe in the it, you know existence of extraterrestrials. It's as soon as you move away from the notion of materialism and into mentalism. And also, I think people struggle with how do you let go of the, the Christian, um, the faiths, not just Christian, but the faiths that will say that they're extremely negative, fallen angels, that type of thing. Because I think there's a lot of people, even very, you know, very pe people that are out there really in the mainstream, even Jordan Peterson will, has that perspective where you know it's very religious based i'm not sure what his perspective is on that specific topic but mm -hmm. but i don't i've never seen people like him step outside and talk about these things so what do you think the disconnect is you know well i think i think in general this is a story as old as mankind itself you know we we fear what we don't know we fear what we don't understand that's why we fear our subconscious mind that's why we fear what we're capable of that we don't want to admit to and then all the things that we crave, particularly from that perspective, we then judge as negative in everybody else. And then we just keep experiencing that same experience over and over and over again. We attract everything we judge until we no longer judge what we attracted. That's what I was going to ask. Do you think that that's playing an effect on it? 100%. Everything. And you can see this in your world, and it's really tied directly to your emotional state. Your emotional state will be the world that gets reflected all around you. If you're feeling an emotional position of sort of like lacking um, uncertainty, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, you'll live in a world that is full of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And it's this subtle thing. And so how can you communicate with your subconscious to reprogram your perception of the conscious mind to actually live a more serene existence and experience a heaven on earth rather than a hell on earth? Um, I think it's through understanding and learning synchronicities. You know, Carl Jung talking about the number of synchronicities we register and experience are directly associated with our degree of ascension along this path of individuation, as he terms it. And I fundamentally believe that to be true, and I've had direct experience with it over and over and over again. I've lived a, a ridiculous life. I've lived an entirely ridiculous life. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, I never thought that I would do the things I did. And it had to be so extreme that I was like, really? This can't be real. I'll give you a funny example of this. Okay. Just a funny example. So when I was in, I don't know if I told this story on this before, but when I was on, um, when I was in college, all these guys were in my dorm room at BYU. Right. And I was Mormon then. I'm not Mormon anymore, but these guys are all these Mormon boys and they're all like looking at, Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. And they're all sitting in my room. And we're a cramped little room, you know, in the oh, dorm. Wow. Totally. It's like, you know, it was like two feet between our beds. It was like tiny in this place. And these guys are all trying to act macho and everything. And, and they're like, so what pickup line do you know, Robert? How would you pick up a girl? What are you going to say to pick up a girl? People still do that, yeah. Yeah, 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 totally, <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> And they were like judging each other's lame pickup lines, right? Yeah. And and so they're looking at three pictures within there. They just kept like coming through the page of the Sports Illustrated. They're like, oh my gosh, Kathy Ireland's so beautiful. She's so hot. And then it was Elle McPherson. Oh my gosh, she's so hot. And it was like Cindy Crawford. Oh my gosh, she's so freaking beautiful. Like what would I ever say to someone like this? And so they're all talking about what they would say. And they came to me and I was kind of sitting there quietly. And I said, I don't know. My sense is, if you guys are all going to say stuff like that, I would probably try to do something the exact opposite. Hmm. And they're like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, because I know she's not going to really probably be attracted. I'm not more attractive than you guys. So I'm just going to be the one that doesn't try to pick her up, but I'll just try to sit there confidently because if I'm timid also, then she won't even notice me. So maybe I'll just sit there confidently and I'll be the one that doesn't ask her out. I said, I'll wait for her to come and ask me what I'm thinking or what I'm about. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> did it work though? So I said, I said, who knows? Maybe in my lifetime, <laughs> all three of these people will actually come and approach me and I won't have to do that. 
So fast forward. This is 1988. Fast forward to 1997. I now live in Sydney, Australia. I'm on Sydney Harbor Bridge waiting in my Holden Statesman. I was the general manager of this company in, in Australia. Way too young to be doing that job. But again, I've lived this kind of strange, bizarre movie script life. And so I'm like, you know, I think I was 20, I guess I was 27 at the time. And driving on the bridge, and I look at the car behind me in the rearview mirror, and everyone's waiting to go to the toll, and it's a $2 toll. And they have these $2 gold coins that are kind of thick, but small, right, in diameter, but it's kind of thick. And, and so you take the coin, you throw it in this bucket thing, and then you get to go through the bridge. So this car behind me was a, uh, was a, a really nice Jaguar. It's a beautiful Jaguar convertible. But I couldn't see who was driving it really. It looked like someone with big hair. It might have been a woman. I didn't really recognize anything. So I just kept minding my business. And I'm the steering wheels are on the right side, not on the left side. And so from my left window, I hear a knock on the window. Like I look over, and it's El McPherson. El McPherson. Now you're thinking of the girl in the red dress on The Matrix. Mm-hmm. And so I look over, and it's El McPherson. I roll down the window. I, I, we had electric windows back then. You know, it's so funny, all these people that thought that 9-11 didn't really happen because people didn't have cell phones back then. I'm like, yeah, we did. And we're not. <laughs> like, this is really stupid, guys. Oh, I used man. to take calls and stuff when I was on, you know, I remember 2001. I was on airplanes around that time. I was living in Israel also. And I can tell you, I was making calls back and forth from my cell phone from airplanes all the time, illegally. And we also used to have phones in the chairs, right, on the airplanes. Yeah. So we had all these things. We had electric windows in, in 1997 also. So I look over, Elle McPherson, and she's not just standing there, like, next to my car. She's wearing a bikini. Her hair's all done up. And she's got this little see-through shawl on. And she's like, hello. She goes, can I borrow $2, please? And I'm like, got to be on candid camera here somewhere. This can't be real. This cannot be real. And I'm like, sure. Now, there's like literally hundreds of cars. And it happened to be my car. She comes, I hand her $2. I don't think about it more. I'm like, wow, that's so crazy. I just bet. And I'm like, she was the biggest model in the world in 1997. She was the most famous. She was everywhere. It was like, oh my gosh, I just met Elle McPherson. So I drive to the hotel I'm going to, which is the Park Hyatt on Circular Quay in Sydney. And normally when I pull up my car, there's all these valet guys who'd come out and they'd take my car. But this time they're not doing that because they see this Jaguar behind me. And it's got Elle McPherson and they knew because she was already checked in the hotel that it was her. So that no one gave a damn about me. And so they passed me and they're like, okay, yeah, we got you. We don't care. We're not going to like talk to you or anything. And they went off and talked to L and L sees me. And she's like, Oh, you're the guy who gave me the $2. Thank you so much. Can I buy you a drink? There it is. And I unfortunately had to say, I'm actually giving a speech here tonight to a bunch of cardiologists, a room full of cardiologists. And I said, I, I can't, but I would love to take a rain check or something. She says, no, we're leaving tomorrow. And I'm like, Oh, that's too bad. Fast forward, 24 years. 24 years. 24 years. I get a request for a podcast a few years ago, a year and a half ago, from a guy named Pete Evans, Australia. And he was the chef in Australia. He ended up getting banned on social media during the whole COVID thing. And, uh, but he had a lot of followers, like 1.5 million followers, and he's one of the casualties of, of that time. So I did this podcast with him. And I get an email from him about a week later saying, uh, Elle McPherson, I copied her on this email, saw our podcast, and she wants to have a meeting with you. I'm like, really? I read down, and, you know, I see what she's written and everything. And I write back, and I say, Elle, we actually met once before. I'm sure you don't remember it. Uh, I said, but it was on Sydney Harbor Bridge and you borrowed $2 from me. And she was like, oh my God, I remember that. Now, the funny part about that was that was uh, on a Friday that that happened. Well, it showed up. We were being followed by paparazzi and it showed up in the Sydney Morning Herald. 
right? Like literally in the page six section where she's like standing right next to my car asking me for $2 and they're like, who's the lucky bloke? And it's my car that was there, right? I'm like, is this real? Can this, all these possibilities, the convergence of all these things, come on. So then I have a, uh, a two hour call with her. We talk about spirituality. She's big time into it and everything. She lives in Florida now. And, and then I had a, a podcast with her. I did a, it was my first, the launch of my first like IG live series of podcasts that I used to do. And, uh, and it was great. And we became friends. So it was one 2008. I'm president of Allergan medical, big pharma company. And we launched Botox and Juvederm and Lapan and Latisse. Also Latisse was getting launched that year. And I happened to get invited to George Clooney's party that he has between Christmas and new year's. Every year, it's like this party for Mike Melman birthday party, and it's in Cabo. So I'm there. There's like, you know, Leo DiCaprio, like this whole crew. It's like this brat pack, all these, like 150 people that are there. And um, I'm talking with Leo. My, and actually, I was talking with Bar, his wife, because she's, she's uh, Israeli and I speak Hebrew. And, and my wife at the time was dancing with Leo. Like, no joke. This is really happening. I'm like, okay, cool. But I'm kind of all by myself because then I think Toby McGuire, someone took off with, um, took off with bar and I'm standing there by myself. Toby McGuire. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Spider-Man guy. <laughs> Let's go. Did yeah. See so the last Spider-Man. I didn't yet. Oh, okay. I didn't yet. So, so, so here I am. Hopefully it doesn't, hopefully it doesn't spoil anything. <laughs> here I am. And then I noticed like Cindy Crawford wearing jeans, right? Yeah. This was a pretty casual party is like hovering around and she walks over to me and she goes, hi, you're Robert Grant, right? I go, why? Yes. <laughs> she goes, she goes, you have this new product called Latisse for eyelash growth. And I said, yeah, she goes, what do I have to do to become your celebrity spokesperson for this? And, and I was like, wait, you're Cindy Crawford, right? She's like, yes. I said, you know my name? She goes, yes. I said, you actually want something from me? She goes, yes. And I said, I'm sorry. I just need a moment to myself. <laughs> just to process. Just to process yeah. this. So that was the second time. Wow. So then the last one was, was uh, Kathy Ireland. 2013, I'm in my office at one of my companies I founded just down the street from here. And, um, I get a call to my office from the front desk. The front desk girl says, there's a Kathy Ireland on the phone to talk with you. And I said, Kathy Ireland, like the model, Kathy Ireland. And she's like, yeah, I don't know. And she didn't know who Kathy Ireland was because she was much younger. And I said, put her through, put her through. Sure enough, it's Kathy Ireland. She says, I just watched your Ted talk. And she goes, I have a whole skincare product line that I would like to, you know, sell together with you. I'd like to do a partnership with you. And I was like, all three now. So in 1990, 1988, I said to all these guys, I said, I have a feeling they're all going to end up reaching out to me. All three did. The likelihood of that happening from a mathematical probability perspective Very, very, very small, right? So I've had so many experiences throughout my life. I've survived three plane crashes. How do you do that? I don't know. How did you? How did you do that? The did you jump out was, the plane or what happened? The first one was Delta Flight 88. I was flying in from Singapore. Uh, we refueled in Alaska. We stopped in Japan. It was an MD-11 plane. And um, we're coming, flying over LAX, and the landing gear won't go down. I'm looking out the window, and nobody knows. We kept hearing the landing gear trying to go down. and go, like this, and we're like, what the hell's going on? This is 1993. And I look out the wing, on the wing, and I notice that there's fuel coming out of the wing because there's no rain outside. But there's like liquid, liquid coming off the wing. And I look down at the airport because we're like, taxing we're going around the airport in circles and i'm like what is going on and i see all these fire trucks ambulance 
they're foaming the runway. I'm like, what is going on? And they didn't tell us until the very last second, like literally right before we had impact, we're coming in for the landing and the landing's supposed to be like this. You know, the back of the plane hits first, I think. But when you have got no front landing gear, you have to hit it nose first. And so we came in and then right before we impacted, they're like brace, brace, brace landing, you know, basically emergency, uh, you know, brace positions. And, and we were all like, what? And I got this incredible bruise from the seatbelt. Like it was horrible. And the plane went off the runway, it happened at LAX. You look it up, went off the runway. We had to go out the emergency slides and there was fire coming off the side of it and everything. It was nuts, man. Everyone screaming, the oxygen mask, the whole nine yards. And the, all the lights were off of the plane. We had to go through the thing, the, the emergency procedures and all that, and live through that. So for people who are listening, and even for people like me who are doing this kind of stuff, what advice do you have to live a life to get to that point where, you know, for me like my goal with this podcast is to be one of the number one in the world. That's my goal. I always mm -hmm. want to be do, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it the best that I can, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and there's a lot of people out there that whatever field that is, it doesn't have to be podcasting. It can be, you know, whether they're on the spiritual path even, and they want to reach their highest potential in any field. What kind of advice would you give someone who wants to do that? I'll tell you what Ellen DeGeneres told me. She doesn't have very good of a reputation anymore. <laughs> but it might be good advice, though. It's good advice. Good advice. Because here's what happened. Yeah, yeah reputation. I mean, the, these things come and go. They do. Yeah. Just like identities. True. Um, here's what happened. I went on vacation to Parrot Key, which is a place in Turks and Caicos. Really cool little island. And just so happened, it was a very secluded, like only small number of rooms, happened that uh, the day before we left, was uh, the Academy Awards, right? When it was still kind of a thing, right? Yeah. Well, it's not really a thing anymore. It's becoming such a joke. Yeah. But, um, and she was the MC for the Academy Awards that year. So I was like, wow, she did it. And she did a really good job. She did a really good job. So here I am, like, and, and, and she was on Oprah the next morning. And then we went the next day, right? The next morning. So we, were, we had to, we land in, um, a place uh, uh, called British Virgin Islands, right? And then you'd go from there to Turks and Caicos and you have to take this boat. So we end up on this boat and lo and behold, who's on the boat with us? Ellen DeGeneres. She just did the Academy Awards. She just did a day of like, you know, her like uh, media circuit, you know, sort of like the victory lap after a successful Academy Awards as MC. And Billy Crystal had done it so many times, you know, all these famous comedians and stuff had done it, but she did a great job. Managed to get through it without pissing off the entire world, right? And so she's on the boat with us going to this resort that not many people are on, right? And Bruce Willis is on this island too. And, and, uh, and Keith Richards, it was really interesting people. It was a fascinating trip. I remember this, but I remember asking her, I'm like, wow, you did an amazing job on, you know, the whole Academy Awards thing. I said, did you have a plan for this your whole life? How did you manifest this? Because I was fascinated to know how she did it. I mean, that in that field, that's the pinnacle. I mean, even today, it's still a pinnacle. I remember when Hugh Jackman did it, I was like, damn, he did a great job. Yeah. But the thing is, she said something really interesting. She said, you know, since I was eight years old, I saw myself doing the Academy Awards as MC. And she said, and every time I would play in my dollhouse, I'd set up this little stage, like Man's Chinese Theater and everything. I have me on the stage. And she goes, and then I would have this recurring nightmare fear that would happen both in dreams and while I was playing with it, that I would get on the stage and I would forget all my lines and I wouldn't know what to say. And it was like the most awkward experience ever. She goes, but I kept always keeping it in my, in my mind that one day I want to do this. I have to do this. I have to do this. And she said, so I decided to flip the script a little bit because I realized that I needed to not think about getting on the stage and forgetting my lines. I needed to instead feel what it felt like the next morning when I read the headlines of how successful it was. Right. Every time you take in a deep breath like that, 
That's something deep to your subconscious telling you, uh, take that in. That's why you take the deep breath. Mm -hmm. So she said this to me. It was pretty profound. And I, I, I remember thinking, yeah, she, you know, because she didn't want to just get to the stage, get the job, and then screw it up. She wanted to actually succeed at it. So her focus from that point forward was to read the headlines and what the headlines said. And all the headlines were really positive at the time that she did that. And keeping that mental discipline and recognizing that it's not the logos, but it's the pathos that actually brings it to you. It's the feeling inside of you. And embodying that feeling. I'll give you another example. I used to buy watches all the time. So this is a watch. I like unique watches, right? It's kind of a unique watch, right? It's, it tells time differently and everything. It's got kind of a whole different approach to, right? It's based on a 60 thing here and it doesn't go all the way around. And it goes, it's called a, a minute repeater, it like jumps backwards. So I used to collect watches. I probably had more than 150 watches at one stage. I stopped doing it now. But the reason I had so many watches is because I used it as a totem. You've seen Inception. Yeah. Right? Okay. So what I would do, yeah, the spin the top, right? Yeah. What I would do is, let's say I woke up in Shanghai one day with my daughter. I was there for two weeks with her when she was 18. I was like a daddy-daughter trip. And I went to, we went to uh, Japan. I used to live and. We went to South Korea and I wanted to take her across China. You know, we went to Beijing and we went to Shanghai. So while we're in Shanghai, I woke up one morning and I felt bad for being away from the office because I knew it was a critical time at work. And I was like feeling anxiety because I had just started my company. It became in two years, a, a, a unicorn company. And so I was like, but before it became unicorn, because we had to get outside investors to come in that were like major you know, venture capital funds. I had this anxiety that like, my gosh, if I got to figure out how to maintain this company, because it was burning through a lot, as most unicorns do, they burn through a lot of cash. They find a big opportunity that people are willing to bet behind, but they end up burning through a lot of cash to get to that stage and beyond. Yeah. So we were at that stage where I think we were burning probably like five, five million a month or something like that. So it's a lot. And Interestingly, so I, I had this anxiety. I'm like, I'm going to run out of money. Oh my God, what's going to happen? Then I'm going to be screwed. And this is going to, ah, I'm going to lose it all. Right. So I wake up with this anxiety from this dream and I grab my daughter. I say, Look, sweetheart, we're going to go to the bulgari store over in the shopping center over there at this Shanghai mall. She's like, Why? Because she said everything's even more expensive here than the U.S. I said, I don't care. We're going to go over to that place. So I said, I have to buy a watch. And she said, why you have so many watches already? I said, I have to buy a watch. So I go to buy this watch that I wanted, which was uh, a watch, not this one, but a similar one, yeah. another Bulgari one, which was a Octo reserve minute repeater type thing. It was a really pretty watch. I'd been looking at it and thinking, Oh, I want to have that watch. I want to have that watch. And the reason I bought the watch it was expensive too. It had to be expensive enough because if this didn't work out, it needed to sting. So you probably heard the story of Cortez. Cortez comes to the coast of Mexico. He's got 300 men with him. They've got six ships. The men go into the forest to go relieve themselves. They look back at the beach and they see all their ships on fire. And Cortez is like, yeah, I burned the ships. You know why? There's 300 of us. And there's 3 million of these Aztecs and they've got all the gold. Right now, obviously it was an entirely reprehensible thing to do as a conquistador. Right. But that's what he thought his mission was. And certainly not something to be bragging about for sure, but no one can deny that either they had providence or luck or something to be able to pull that off. But a core aspect of it in his own memoirs was he burned the ships because he didn't want his men to feel they had any other options. That, right? that one's either, getting in right now. We are, we either, I know what you're saying. Mm -hmm. We either go and make it happen or we're just going to die. Right. It's that, that simple. Or you run out of money or whatever it might be. Or you run out of money or whatever it is. So the reason I bought watches like that is because most people practice some delayed gratification. They would buy themselves a watch after they present the challenge. They succeed in overcoming the challenge, right? Or the obstacle, whatever it may be. And then they have a celebration for themselves and then they feel really good. And for those people that have been like hyper, uh, overachievers their lifetimes, they'll realize that that 
moment, literally moment, is so short that you feel satisfied. Because that in itself is kind of a drug. But the more you experience it, the more you have to take bigger risks, the more you have to take you know, more difficult challenges to get that same high from achieving, right? And, and I was one of those overachiever types. The reason I would buy the watch is I flipped the script. Like, how do I burn the ships? There's no going back. The ships aren't, there's no ships coming to Mexico, but for a year. We got one year to make this work. We're all going to die. So my philosophy was every time I looked at my watch, I remembered celebrating achieving the task that I wanted to achieve. So I was celebrating and feeling that celebration every time I looked at my watch. That was a totem as a reminder. So until the day that I achieved that thing, I would only wear that watch. Because every time, I, and this is back before we had iPhones, you know, we had iPhones, but they weren't being used as like clocks back then. Now they've become a more efficient clock than this, right? Because you're literally tied to it all the time. But I would look at my watch. Every time I look at my watch, I'd be like, oh, cool watch. And I'm like, yeah, congratulations, Archie. You achieved this big challenge. You got the big VC investment at the 700 million pre-money valuation. And I played that over in my head over and over and over and over. And I associated it with the emotion of that success. And every single time it worked. So it's about being in the end already emotionally. It is embodying the achievement and the feeling and that feeling of success and happiness and abundance before you would actually face the task. Do you see that as a universal law? Yes. Yes. It is absolutely, you know, our thoughts, our words, and our actions are inextricably linked together. So our thoughts become our words and our words, you could say our thoughts become our judgments, our judgments become our words. Our words, and that's our, how we interpolate society at large or how we interpret the universal experience that we're going through. Maybe it doesn't even exist until we observe it. Maybe there's no such thing as time anyway in the first place. And then what we then have as actions become our habits. And those habits become directly associated with our karmic cycles. And what is karma anyway? The definition of karma is just destiny. But what if what we call destiny is actually just the free will of the higher self. What if it's what you chose all along? That means then karma's choice. Ooh. Means there's really no mistakes. Means there's only learnings. And the opportunity to peel back that onion and understand another depth, another, we're plunging the depths of ourselves. And as we understand ourselves, we go deeper and deeper within and learn acceptance and love, then that extends to the whole world around us because as we love ourselves, we, we tend to judge the world around us based on what we crave. As above, so below. Almost. Yes. As above, so below. So that is a correspondence principle, right, of hermeticism. So I started noticing all these mental aspects of the universe, but I thought I was just like this, this you know, manifestation Jedi type of thing because I was good at it. And I could always see the future. I could always predict trends. I could always see when things were going to happen. But sometimes you know, people would think I was crazy a little bit, maybe a lot, because I would take big risks. But I was always grounded. I'm a tourist, so you know, I could manifest stuff. And so you know, you know the difference between like a crazy old man and a charming older gentleman to society? You told me this on the phone one time. I remember, I think. <laughs> a few million dollars. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So, I mean, that it's is true. the way society... It, it's so true. That's how people perceive. If you have no money and you're saying the spiritual path, people aren't going to take you seriously. Then if you have some oh, money... If you're Elon Musk, you're saying we live in a simulation. He's like, oh, the guy's a genius, man. Right. And then, But if you're like Just some normal, dude yeah. who has no money, who's on the side of the street, who's like bumming for, for dough, then it's like, that guy's crazy, man. He's lost it. What the F? But he's saying the exact same thing. He's not wrong. 
Mm-hmm. This is the way we look at the world. It's our own conditioning biases. It's like, yeah, you can be crazy as long as you can pay the bills, bro. Right? That's mm-hmm. the way we exist in this world. So I hope, though, that you take what I just said because it works. But then I realized, okay, because then I was like so into this. I'm like, How many other things can I manifest, man? Because I can manifest this stuff. I just got to, and it takes a lot of discipline to rid your mind of negative self narratives. That's the hardest part. I got asked yesterday in a podcast I did uh, at the LA blockchain conference. They're like, okay, if you could send a push message to the whole world, what would it say? And I said, free your mind from your, all of your negative self narratives and have the courage to be the change you want to see in the world. It's that simple. So then on that note, Mm -hmm. do you see a difference when you say free? I'm really interested in this concept Mm -hmm. because there seems to be a polarization of people that we're going free versus it's there, but we aren't listening. You know what I'm saying? There's like a really subtle, like, is it it ever going to go away? Are the, are the thoughts ever going to go away? Does that make sense? Um, Because I've seen here, here's an example. Mm -hmm. I've seen people say, you don't need to clear your mind. You just need to stop feeding the negativity because when you stop feeding it, it will go away by itself or it won't mean anything. So do you still have those thoughts that come up? And do you think it's more of like a, the subconscious after enough, you know, you've done this for a long time. Mm -hmm. So is it after enough time, those subconscious thoughts, the subconscious thoughts that are manifested from the feelings that you used to, Mm-hmm. consistently feel mm-hmm. do they just basically subside or how do you how do you see that process because i think that's a really important subtle i think for me first of all i wasn't even aware that i was because i've always been a pretty positive person i wake up in the morning happy like every day i'm happy even last night i didn't get much sleep at all because my kids were up all night because they're not feeling well and it was kind of a difficult night but i still woke up like hi I'm always happy in the morning. And it's like confounding to even the people that I've lived with. They're like, why are you always in a good mood? That's so irritating, man. Like, what the hell? I'm like, <laughs> they think you're being fake or something almost. They think I'm being fake. Yeah, but I'm not being fake. It's 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 legit. It's real. I just have some people have that disposition, I think. So I to that point. I wasn't even aware that I had negative self narratives. You know how I identified that I had them? Through my judgments of other people. My judgments of other people were the tell. I'll give you an example. I used to stand watching Donald Trump. Like the dude drove me insane. And I'm the like, antics, not because a little bit of the antics, yes, and the bluster and all that stuff, but not actually even those things as much. What it really was was his policies, a lot of them were not bad, but the way he communicated them were horrible because of the antics and the bluster and all of that other stuff. And so I would be like, oh, why does he do this? Why can't he just like, you know, like listen a little bit more. It doesn't have to always be about him. And, but then I realized, wait a minute, anyone who calls out the ego of another person is only suffering from ego separation themselves. It's not the humble person that looks at Donald Trump and says, you're an egomaniac. I know plenty of people that, are so, they believe they're so humble that they become arrogant in their humility. You know people like that? Oh, absolutely. So then I had to stop myself and say, hmm, I'm judging Donald Trump maybe because I crave some of the ways that he is acting and being. Maybe I have characteristics. Maybe I'm just looking at a reflection of myself. So I forced myself, whenever I started to judge him, stop myself and say out loud, I am that I am. And everybody be like, what the hell is it? Cause I'd be in the middle of a conversation. I'd like stop myself. I'm like, no. And I'm like, I am that I am. And it was like a punishment in a way, but it caused me to stop mid sentence. Mm-hmm. And I really stuck to that. And I started noticing it made a difference. It made a big difference because I started thinking, 
these things that I'm judging in other people are actually just the things I don't like about myself? Ah, I am that I am. Yikes. What that did, though, is it started to trigger this subconscious realize this conscious realization of the subconscious negative narrative that was going on. And by, by realizing that I then thought, okay, I must have negative narrative going on, but I'm not even conscious that I'm having the negative narrative. So now I know that I have negative narrative because it's somewhere. It has to thoughts precede the words, the thoughts precede the judgments, the judgments precede the words. So I started thinking, okay, I just need to continue to practice this and start instead to practice acceptance. And it caused me also to analyze myself and say, what in me, if I'm triggered on something, what in me is so bothered by how another person is acting or being? Is there a larger message? And is that larger message something from my higher self? Why, when I have a failure or a bad outcome or a disappointment or a heartbreak, did I have to experience it? What was the reason for what I chose? No longer separating myself from that decision, no longer applying someone else or me as a victim to that circumstance, but rather looking at it and saying, I played an active role in this. I just need to now connect with that part of my personage, part of my overall self, the higher self, that determined that this was the very best thing for my highest and best result. So that changed everything. Because as soon as I started thinking like that, then it was like, you know, and that happened at the same time I started realizing that facts aren't really facts, they're just facets. Of a larger prism of a whole. And in order to understand and see it in the mind of God, the universe, you have to be able to see from its facets. How do I expand my awareness to be able to see the sum of as best as I can, because I never will be able to do it. But we can achieve varying degrees of it. And that was where geometry Because Geometry is all about expanding. It's, it's like we call it angels, but actually and hmm. angles of perspective. You know, uh, Saul Alinsky said, our world is not a world of angels, rather it is a world where men speak of moral principle, yet act on power principle. A world where we are always moral and our enemies are always And I remember reading that in this book called The 48 Laws of Power, Robert Greene, and thinking, gosh, is that true? Is whatever that I believe consciously and subconsciously that will benefit my conscious mind. What I will choose as the only ethical choice. Is there no objectivity to ethics? It was a hard one. It was a really hard one to grasp. Because what it forced me then to do is to realize all the bullshit I've been telling myself. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's not all these people trying to hold us down. All this stuff. When you realize the universe is mental, no one to look at but yourself. So truly awakened people aren't judgmental. The ones that are woke and tossing out judgments like mad, they're just at earlier stages of their awakening process. And how do you think we can set boundaries with that without judgment? Or do you think it's necessary? Because then you come to this process of if the world is just what it is and it's just us in this mental universe, then do we want to facilitate change in the world? Do we want to, you know, that's the age old question, you know, then you have the masters who decided, you know, they're just going to radiate in that self realization you call God consciousness. So where do you think the balance is between that? The only things that the masters have taught is the illusion of it all. Mm -hmm. That's the consistent thread. Because if you try to judge something, then you easily fall into the syndrome that I call the hammer and nail syndrome. A hammer seeks a nail. Whatever it is that is your pet project, I'm all for, you know, a deforest, no, for stopping deforestation, right, in Brazil. Yeah. yeah. So you can apply all of your effort and work to this, and you'll make some improvements. 
But in the world around you, the parts that you can't yourself touch, you'll only find that same thing replicating itself. Again, it'll become a worldwide pandemic of deforestation. You'll never actually be able to. Because you have to first realize the universe is mental. Take the concept of materiality out of your mind altogether and realize that there's nobody else here that's destroying the rainforest but you. You. And so you're creating an opposer within. And then the more opposition you apply to that activity, the more opposition you'll face. You create your own inertia, your own pushback, your own challenge, your own difficulty. Until you finally surrender and release and say, I want to be the change I hope to see in the world. So that change is accomplished through acceptance. We're not here in this construct of extreme judgment and scarcity and lack of abundance and all these things to, to learn more judgment, scarcity, lack of abundance, and shame. We're here to learn to transcend those things. We're here to learn how to love. We're here to learn how to love ourselves and how to love everybody else. And through loving ourselves completely, we will love everybody else. And then by that activity and truly feeling it within, the world will start to transform around us. Sudden, there won't be as much deforestation. The things that we apply our force against are the things that will only butt up against us more. Yeah. Wait for a second. Yes. Man. Yeah, I will. Like five more minutes. Yeah, just tell them I'll be on in five more minutes. Okay. Is that the math magicians? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it that time? Yeah, it's that time. Okay. So we we'll can wrap up. We can probably, uh, we could also do it right after, I think. Yeah, I've got some time right after from sure. 4 to 4.30. So we could do it then. I'm glad you got to be here for that. That was like, whoa. Yeah, We've I been mean, trying to solve that forever, man. You're just discovering the secrets of the universe, and I just happen to be present. I'm I'm here for it. And and how cool it is that it actually played out. Exactly here, I am trying to show the grid of space time, and how the grid works, and how it's basically this harmonic of three and two. Because perfect fifth is three over two, the major third is the cubed root of two. It's another way to look at three over two. So it's all three and two, three separation. And then, you know, binary within each of those cubes. And then it gets represented exactly like that inside the freaking Enochian tables. What in the actual? I mean, and, I, and then I'm just like randomly going, oh, yeah, speed of light is the number of the people in the encampment of Judah. I got to find this. And I'm like searching for it, searching. I finally find, find it. And then that is the cipher to the Enochian tables. Yeah. So for. <laughs> <laughs> to catch everyone up, basically, I just watched him uncover, I think, probably at least a very old encryption in the Bible that is referring to many of the scientific discoveries, and specifically with numbers. And light with speed. the math, with mm -hmm. the light speed. And mm -hmm. um, there was other ones too, but it's it's as though these and you said it was who you who you thought who did you think it was that, that encrypted that so the king james version of the bible was actually written by a group of people that also had another code name that they wrote under called shakespeare and those people included a group of the following individuals now i'm not sure john d because john d was already dead but because the king james bible was finished in 1611 mm -hmm. but um shakespeare was time a group of people which included sir francis bacon edward de vere kit marlowe and john d and john d was famous for being the queen's mathematician and astrologer and uh john d channeled along with edward kelly a guy that he worked with while living in prague the enochian tables so the enochian tables in enoch is another name for thoth so hermes Mm -hmm. So we've been trying to crack and find the cipher for the Enochian tables. We actually found it today inside Numbers chapter two, which is 
kind of super epic. Yeah. Because it literally unraveled right in front of us mm -hmm. as we're doing it. Like, we're all like, wait, I see this, I see this. It was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. That's incredible. And who knows how more there is, but, you know, there's a whole nother conversation about who is Hermes and Thoth and all of these ancient figures and how they might be just the same being. You know, mm -hmm. reincarnated, or maybe they're not. Maybe they're just all accessing the di the same truth from different points. We talked about earlier interstellar and encrypting things through time. And it's almost like that. Maybe that's what that was. I think it was. Yeah, I think it definitely was. Yeah, and you know, I'm not gonna lie. That was pretty. It was freaky, but fun at the same time because I've never we've decrypted a lot of things before as a group. You know, referencing this group that we have. It's a research team of physicists and mathematicians, but also uh, people that are mystics, and esotericists. So they happen to be a foot in both realms, right? So we, we, we can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the top mathematicians and physicists in the world, but also we understand the esoteric meanings behind things because we know that the universe is mental. And when you realize it's mental, then so much can become available to you and it's instantaneous because it's a reflection of your own feelings inside of you and then as you express those authentic feelings with inside of you and you're no longer afraid to express them to the outer world then the reflection back is instantaneous it can be instantaneous yeah and uh i'm experiencing that more and more every day and uh and meeting people like yourself and and, and how it's transforming my life and it's almost like the more I love the world around me, the more the world and, and take risks as well, because it's not like before I would have been, I had to separate my life into different buckets, right? I was like businessman. And so I, I'd have a talk track of what I'd say as a businessman. I have a talk track for what I'd say as a math guy. And I'd have a talk track for what I'd say in physics or math. I'd have a talk track for what I'd say in a healthcare environment or a FinTech environment or whatever environment. Now in the last two years, I've, really been deliberate about integrating all of those into one discussion and not worrying anymore about trying to cater to different audiences, but just rather focus on being authentic. That's what I'm trying to do is I don't have a specific category. What are you talking about on the podcast? It's a bunch of different stuff. It's not, it's not all just, that's why I don't curate these conversations in a specific direction because I think it, it's all connected. And if you start to, try and put yourself into a box of I need to talk this way or be this type of person. You're, you're missing out on all these other aspects of you. And I feel like combining them all into one being is like, that's where the most power is, you know? So, but I think that'll do it. Thank you so much, Nick. We're going to do this again for sure. Yes. Thank and, you for and, coming and on. If, if you want to join us at another point in time for our, for what you just witnessed, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll arrange it for sure. For sure. And where can people find you? Robert Edward Grant on Instagram, robertedwardgrant.com on my website, but I'm on uh, every social media platform. Um, and also I have a book called Philomath. Right. I'm grabbing it. Check out Philomath. He was kind enough. Got the signed copy. Let's go. This is a great book. I already have it on uh, online, but to have it in person, it's really nice. The hardcover. I don't have a hardcover for my book. I'm sure there's plenty of math. There is. To go around in here. But it's all new. Yeah. That's the thing. If you read it also, you don't have to have a huge in-depth knowledge of mathematics. Yeah. There's no algebra. There's very, very little algebra in it. So don't worry. <laughs> hey. Because, hey, by that's the fine. way. By the way, I got to say, I'm better at algebra. I got to, I did really well in the college algebra. High school, not great. But then I actually started trying. This is, you know. This is predominantly geometric, okay. which the visibility, the visualization of, of geometry is what makes it easy mm -hmm. to comprehend. Yeah. So we like to put everything in wave and geometric form. Yeah. And you've got plenty of diagrams in here. I mean, mm -hmm. got everything in here. So check out the book if you're interested in that. And also just knowing more about the nature of reality, because it really seems throughout that meeting and everything. Mm -hmm. It's geometric. And, and check out my TV show Code X on Gaia and mm -hmm. on Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. See you guys.
All right, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Universe the Game, and if you did, consider subscribing and sticking around for many more fascinating episodes just like this one. All right, and check out today's sponsor, my book, 10 Secrets of Awakening, The Secrets to Understanding Consciousness, Life Transformation, and Self-Realization. If you're interested in those topics and improving your life, I would recommend checking out the book as well. Other than that, we will see you on the next episode. We've got plenty more, so take a look around here, and I'm sure you'll find an episode that you're interested in. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one. Until then, peace.